Hello to everyone who has just joined. We're just waiting. Uh, give it a little time to let folks come in and then we'll get started. All right, it looks like we can go ahead and get started now. Hello again, everyone. My name is Emily Neckrish, and I am the Web and Social Media Content Manager at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where we collect, preserve, and share the history of the Smithsonian Institution. On behalf of the Archives, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second program in our series, Smithsonian 175th Film Fest, Films from the Smithsonian Institution Archives. Before we get started, I wanna gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway people on whose ancestral homelands I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their homes here. And now for a few details about how this program will all work. So note that the chat box is where we'll be communicating with you throughout the program and where we'll post links as they come up in the discussion. We encourage you to use the Q&A box for any questions you might have throughout the program. And before I turn it over, I wanna share a little about our next program in the series. Mark your calendars for Friday, October 22nd at 12 noon Eastern time, when Herschel and librarian Jacqueline Protka will screen three films from the early days of the museum. Following the films, she'll interview Herschel and librarian Emeritus, Anna Brooke, about establishing the Herschel and Library. Uh, we're gonna pop a link to that program in the chat now. And now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Kira Sobers. Kira is the Media Digitization Manager for the Smithsonian Institution Archives. She has overseen the digitization workflow of field notes, documents, audio, and video materials from initial cataloging to online access for the last 10 years. In her presentation, she'll cover how we tackle audiovisual digitization at the archives, She'll introduce the Smithsonian's new audiovisual media preservation initiative, and she'll highlight the types of AV materials we have in our collections. She'll then screen part of To Tropic Seas, Word Valero 3, a film that follows Smithsonian curator Waldo LaSalle Schmidt on his 1930s trip to the Galapagos Islands. After the screening, Kira will stick around to answer any of your questions about her work or about the film. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Kira. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. As Emily said, my name is Kira Sobers, and I am the Media Digitization Manager for the Archives. One of my major duties is preserving the archives audiovisual content, which is what I'll be discussing with you today. The archives began its foray into in-house AV digitization in February 2008 with a pilot project using, at the time, brand new equipment called the Sama Solo which is basically a big computer with a great processor inside. The pilot project consisted of AV archivists from a handful of units around the institution, testing out the hardware and software to see if it was worth purchasing the product. The pilot was successful and the archives purchased two SAMAs that would be housed in our offices at the archives, but made accessible for any AV archivist around the Smithsonian to come and use for their collections. In September 2008, I was brought on as a contractor to digitize a subset of our video history collection using this new equipment. That next year, we decided to digitize the rest of the video history collection, as well as a set of security camera-esque footage of giant pandas Ling Ling and Sing Sing from the National Zoological Park. The summer of 2011 was busy on the AV front. With the video history and panda projects complete, I began digitizing additional video materials on demand, which 
We also upgraded the SAMAs to the latest version of the hardware, which included introducing barcodes into our video digitization workflow. And we began digitizing digital audio tapes or DAT tapes in-house. In May, 2016, we received internal grant funds to do a massive DAT digitization project that primarily consisted of collections containing large numbers of the format. In April, 2017, we received additional funds to set up our own more robust in-house audio digitization station. And in January, 2020, I completely revitalized our video digitization setup and officially retired the SAMIS. As of 2018, the archives has over 61,000 audiovisual assets in 45 different formats in our collections. We do not have the equipment to digitize all 45 of those formats in house. So here's a breakdown of the formats that we can do. The ones in blue are audio formats and the reddish pink are video formats. We do not currently have the ability to digitize motion picture film in house, but we do have the ability to rehouse and stabilize the films. Now, why do we digitize audiovisual materials? Well, access is one reason, but the primary reason is because for most audiovisual materials, digitization is the only method of preservation. One of the reasons that digitization is considered preservation for audiovisual materials is issues with playback deck availability. Majority of the AV formats that have existed over time require a specialized deck to view and preserve the content. Most of these decks are no longer manufactured, which means that there is a shortage of replacement parts and technicians who can make these function properly. Additionally, every one of the decks you see in this picture on the right can play one, maybe two types of videotape. And as I said earlier, the archives has over 48 different formats in our collections. Does anyone remember the Betamax slash Betacam war? Our collections certainly do. Another reason digitization is preservation is format degradation. According to a report from the Library of Congress that came out in 2012, majority of the audiovisual formats will not last more than 20 years before the content is lost forever. Unlike motion picture film, where you can see the images even if the film itself is unplayable, magnetic media, such as the VHS and cassette tapes most of us had as kids, are designed such that they need to be played in order to retrieve the content. Even magnetic media stored in the most ideal conditions is prone to condition issues such as sticky shed, where the content layer literally sheds from the tape, making it unplayable. The quarter inch open reel audio tape shown here was unlucky and the adhesive that once held down this tape in order to keep it in a good tight wind has since failed, causing the tape to unwind and the strands to curl in on themselves. This makes getting a good clean digital recording of this material difficult and can ultimately result in some of the content being lost. Here are some more extreme examples of format degradation in our collections. The image on the left is a wax cylinder that is suffering from plasticize, plasticizer exudation. And so it has the disadvantage of being a rare format with condition issues. The image on the right is of a 16 inch lacquer transcription disc that is quite literally falling apart. You can see that the lacquer is cracked in numerous places and the silver colored core is even shining through in a few spots due to missing lacquer. Once either of these things happens, it is incredibly difficult to get any meaningful content from the assets. These are some very extreme examples of why digitization is preservation for audiovisual content, but there are many items in better condition that are still at risk of content loss, and I will get into them, that more in just a minute. So exactly how much material do we have to preserve? In 2015, a group of AV archivists at the Smithsonian identified the need to complete a pan-institutional survey of audiovisual collections in order to determine exactly how much material we had that we had and the risk of losing that material. The primary goals of the survey were to document the quantities and formats of the collections at a group level and gather data about our greatest strengths and needs in audiovisual collections care and deliver this data to unit stakeholders in a usable form. The survey was completed by an independent contractor and designed with four components, an inventory, a general condition assessment, a multiple choice questionnaire, and a narrative staff interview. The participants were made up of the eight units who hold the majority of audiovisual collections at the institution. And at the end of the survey, each unit received a copy of their inventory spreadsheet and an individualized report that highlighted unit specific information. The final project report is available through the archives website. Once the survey wrapped up, we had some great foundational data regarding collection format counts, but it had us questioning how prepared we were for long-term preservation of these audiovisual collections. Because of this, the audiovisual preservation readiness assessment was developed as a three component assessment to be completed by an outside contractor. 
To start, we continued the collection survey to include three additional units who showed interest in being part of this project using the same methodologies from the 2016 survey. And we allowed the original eight units to provide collection additions to add to the overall data. For component two, the contractor developed an easy to use system to prioritize the collections within each unit, taking into account format degradation and content value. Lastly, component three included a comprehensive evaluation of our current digitization workflows, staffing infrastructure, and costs of preservation in order to evaluate the institution's overall readiness to undertake audiovisual preservation and determine our risk of collection loss. After the collection additions and data from the three new units were added up, the survey identified over 293,000 audiovisual assets across the Smithsonian, with a little over half of those being audio and the rest being split fairly evenly between video and motion picture film. The graph on the left shows the breakdown Smithsonian-wide versus the breakdown within the archives collection. The archives has the second largest collection of AV assets at the Smithsonian, and it should be no surprise that the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage and the Human Studies Film Archives have the largest collections of audio and motion picture film, respectively. The contractors identified five major concerns during the assessment. The first and most important one was that based on staff interviews, it was estimated that about 87% of the audiovisual materials across the participating units were unpreserved. Based on the average number of assets being preserved annually across all units, it would take us 394 years to preserve everything we have. And given the 15 year lifespan I mentioned earlier, this means we are at risk of losing nearly 189,000 items. Additionally, not all units have the adequate storage for their AV collections, making improper environmental conditions a concern and shortening the lifespan of the materials even further. Another concern is that most units don't have a collection management system that allows for item level cataloging. And if they do, AV assets aren't usually cataloged at the item level until they're digitized. This makes it hard to know exactly what is in the collection and hard to prioritize. Also, the Smithsonian currently does not have a good way to provide online access to digitized AV collections. Most units use YouTube to post their videos, but it is not an adequate solution for our collection materials. Lastly, of all the units surveyed, only one unit has a staff person who is dedicated to AV preservation 100% of the time, and they are a term employee working on a grant project. This is a major contributing factor to the low preservation rate seen at many of the units. So what is the solution? Now that we have all this information, what's the best course of action moving forward? Enter AVMPI. The Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative is being developed as a centralized resource that will help alleviate some of the burden from individual Smithsonian units to catalog, preserve, and provide access to audiovisual collections across the institution. While the initiative will be overseen by the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, AVMPI will provide equal support to all units who have minimal resources for the holistic management and preservation of these unique collections. The strategic plan for AVMPI consists of five overall goals. The first is to develop a new state-of-the-art facility to support the conservation and digitization of audiovisual collections. Since that process could take quite a while, the initiative is also working closely with Smithsonian facilities to identify and outfit a space that could support these activities for up to five years. The second goal is collection prioritization that would look at both high prior that would both look at both collection content and format degradation to determine which collections should be high priority for preservation. Next, the development of workflows will streamline unit processes into one concise pan-institutional strategy for several tasks, including imaging, the creation of digital files, quality control checks, and physical stabilization and rehousing of materials. Working closely with the Smithsonian's IT office, the fourth goal is to ensure that the digital infrastructure at the Smithsonian can support the rapid generation of large preservation quality files. And lastly, the initiative will develop new solutions for providing access to audio and moving image files to support the increase and diffusion of knowledge. The initial AVMPI team will consist of seven positions for the, with the first hires being the initiative coordinator and curator of recorded media. We are currently accepting applicants for these two positions through USA Jobs. The two media conservation specialists will focus on the physical preparation and descriptive cataloging of each media asset that is preserved through the initiative. We'll have two preservation specialists, one for audio and one for video, that will be responsible for the digital transfer, quality control, and ingest of each file into our digital asset management system. In order to support accessibility goals, there will also be a rights and reproduction specialist. 
So all of that is great, but what exactly are we trying to preserve? The Smithsonian Institution Archives contains the records of the history of the institution, its people, its programs, its research, and its stories, and the audiovisual collections reflect that. Our audio collections include things like Smithsonian hosted lectures and workshops, interviews conducted as part of our oral history program or, co or collected for use in exhibition elements, and radio programs created by the Smithsonian or societies with heavy Smithsonian involvement. The items listed here are just examples and do not include the entirety of our collection's contents. Currently, two of my favorite radio programs in our collections are The World is Yours, which was the Smithsonian's first radio show and aired from 1936 to 1942. It is often considered one of the most successful educational radio programs of its time. My other favorite is the radio show Adventures in Science, which featured Watson Davis, head of a science society called Science Services, interviewing notable scientists of the day on their work, such as his interview with Walter Grant on the topic of air conditioning. Our moving image materials are very diverse. They include episodes and camera original footage from Smithsonian television series like the Smithsonian World, camera original animal observations, such as footage of the original Smokey Bear at the National Zoological Park, as well as footage of animals in the wild, like the clip you see here of Sri Lankan macaques climbing on a Volkswagen bus. We also have the recordings from public programs, such as concerts put on by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and a panel featuring the stars of MASH prior to the exhibit opening at the National Museum of American History. Being that part of our mission is to preserve the history of the Smithsonian, we of course have video footage documenting historical moments like Lady Bird Johnson's donation of her inauguration gown to the Smithsonian's Hall of First Ladies, as you can see in this clip, as well as video interviews and expedition footage. And speaking of expedition footage, it is my pleasure to now share with you one of my favorite films, To Tropic Seas Aboard Valero 3. This film follows the crew of the Hancock Pacific Galapagos expedition on their adventure. It has been edited to fit within our allotted time, but the full film will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. And with that, I hope you all enjoy the film. The launching of Valero 3 was a spectacular event. Hold your seats and don't stand up, folks, for over she goes sideways. It was indeed a thrilling moment for the designers and builders of the ship, who heaved a sigh of relief as she came to rest in the quiet waters of the Craig Shipyards at Long Beach, California. Three months later, completely equipped, Valero 3 was ready to begin her maiden voyage to the Lapagos Islands and beyond. She was a beautiful sight as she sped out of the inner harbor at Los Angeles. On her after deck, you catch sight of two of four auxiliary craft that were to prove so valuable in bringing back living specimens to the zoo at San Diego and the preserved specimens for the University of Southern California. Past the familiar lighthouse at the tip of the breakwater at Point Furman, Road Valero 3. Now every expedition has a mascot, and ours was no exception. And allow me to present Chico, our monkey mascot, upon whom we could depend at all times and do the right thing at the wrong time or the wrong thing at the right time, whichever you prefer. Our first stop was to be at Guadalupe Island, located 200 miles south of San Diego and about 100 miles off the west coast of Lower California. The going was rough and our scientists, not accustomed to sea travel, stayed below decks for reasons they would not divulge to a soul. But Chico was onto their tricks and had many a laugh at the expense of these landlubber scientists. Few people realize that it is not possible for us to tie up to a wharf at Guadalupe Island. Instead, we must anchor a mile or more offshore. And here is Captain Hancock giving the signal as the anchor drops in 12 fathoms or 72 feet of water, our customary anchorage. And from this point, we land through the surf in a small skiff such as this. But look out, over she goes, and it's a wetting for everyone. There were many sharp lava boulders in the surf at Guadalupe Island and our skiff might easily have cracked up upon them. 
The man in the stern is vainly endeavoring to hold high and dry a reflex camera, but unfortunately, overgo camera and all. We were met by a reception committee. We called them the Guadalupe Island Chamber of Commerce. Our quarry were further down the beach. Sea elephants, 1,500 of them, and we were going to attempt to capture two of them alive to take back to the San Diego Zoo. The cows sought refuge in secluded tide pools, but the big bellowing bulls lined up along the black lava beach. And now you will see why they are called sea elephants, for this trunk-like snout has suggested the name. Our photographer is very busy. He is focusing upon 10,000 California sea lions. And believe it or not, the San Benitez Islands of Mexico have the largest lions club on the Pacific coast, sea lions. Every year in the month of May and June, these sea lions gather for the purpose of having their young. And here I might explain that among sea lions, the male is known as the bull. The females are the cows, and the young ones are called, not calves as you would expect, but pups. And so we have the unusual circumstance of a cow giving birth to pups. Half a dozen of these cows will gather in a secluded tide pool, each with her pup, and over them, is a great bellowing bull, but there are always extra men around, and when these intruders come, it always means an argument. The challenge to battle is issued on dry land, but just as soon as the combatants get underway, they will take to water, for they are much more at home in that medium. The first thing Mother Seal does is to tuck the youngsters out of sight. Baby seals are, if anything, more adorable than puppies. And if you walk across a beach on which a dozen of these baby seals are sunning themselves, you will stop 12 times and pick up each one in turn, for each one seems to be just a little cuter than the one before. And here are mother and infant enjoying a siesta. From Guadalupe Island, we traveled southward around the tip of Lower California around Cape San Lucas and into the Sea of Cortez as the Gulf of California was known to the early Spanish buccaneers. The going was rough and once again our scientists stayed below deck. We came to Tiburon Island. The rattlesnake seems to say, don't tread on me. He is a gentleman at heart and prefers to warn before striking, but no gentleman is the choya or jumping cactus which attacks unexpectedly and from the rear, much to the discomfiture of our scientists. It seems that even little horned toads and lizards have spines in this forsaken country, and Mr. Andrew Chafee is remarking upon the fact. We will join Captain Hancock and Mr. Chafee in a trek across country in the Gulf of California region. At every step, they are sinking in ankle deep in the soft earth. They must be constantly on the alert, for at any moment, a great boulder may come hurtling down from above, threatening to start an avalanche and leave a trail of disaster in its wake. Here comes one now. Let's get out of here, said Mr. Chafee. I'm coming too, said the captain, faster perhaps than he realized. Wait for me, said Mr. Chafee. And as the two men reached the bottom of the cliff, each picks himself up and makes sure that there are no broken bones. The captain and Mr. Chafee seem to have come to the end of their trail, and from this promontory they are able to look out across beautiful Agua Verde Bay, where Valero Free lies at anchor, and to the dredge boat beyond, where Dr. Waldo Schmidt of the United States National Museum is supervising dredging operations. Here is the coil with its 2,000 feet of quarter-inch steel cable. It enables us to drag the ranch al along the bottom of the ocean at a depth of almost half a mile. When the dredge comes up, it's anyone's guess what it may contain. Dr. Schmidt dumps its contents on a platform especially erected for the purpose. And Dr. Fraser of the University of British Columbia 
helps him in sorting over the material. And from what looks to you and to me to be just a mass of rock and bits of coral and shell and seaweed and sand and gravel, the scientists are able to secure specimens such as this little crab. When placed upon the stage of a compound microscope, he shows that he is a decorator crab, so called because he possesses the unusual ability of fastening to his appendages bits of seaweed and hydroids until he becomes indistinguishable from his surroundings. And this crab will not show his face to the camera. He's like a movie actor wearing dark glasses. The sea urchin is a relative of the starfish, as we discover upon examining its circular mouth. For about the mouth there are five teeth arranged in radial symmetry. These are hermit crabs, each fighting for the possession of a shell which belongs to neither one of them, for the hermit crab lives in a cast-off mollusk shell. And this fellow has discovered some friends in the audience. Why, look, there's Bill, and there's Mary, and there's Martha, and here are two scientists from the university having turned over a rock, and they have discovered underneath it a brittle star, so-called because upon the slightest touch it will fracture into a thousand fragments. This is not the octopus, it is the basket star. We found 23 of them in one dredge hall in the Gulf of California. A mollusk not satisfied with his own home has added first a front porch and then a back porch and then a couple of bay windows. In other words, he has increased the diameter of his own shell by cementing to it the shells of other mollusks. If we pry apart three rock oysters, we find burrowing into their hard shell another mollusk which is known as a burrowing pittock. It is about the shape and the size and the color of a date seed, and it secretes an acid that eats its way into the carbonate of lime of which the shell of the oyster is composed. These pittocks do a great deal of damage, not only to oyster beds, but also to coral heads and to cement piling. If we insert a knife blade and pry open the valves of the rock oyster, we find an unexpected guest inside, a crab, the female of a species which must live in the digestive tract of the oyster. Once a year, the free-swimming male enters for the purpose of fertilizing the eggs. This relationship is known as commensalism, indicating that the oyster shelters the crab, but what the crab does for the oyster I do not know. Not all hermit crabs live in a mollusk shell. Here is one living in a bryozoan animal. And when he goes into his little house, he closes the door securely behind him. This unusual gadget is known as the coral grapple. It is used in conjunction with a square box or water glass. Coral occurs in tropic seas in shallow water. And by means of fastening the coral grapple about the huge cauliflower-like heads, we are able to drag them to the surface. Of course, they appear much heavier in air than in water. Sometimes the coral grows in places where it would be impossible to hold a skiff steady on account of the surge, and it is necessary for us to don bathing trunks and go after it in this fashion. But when one comes back from a coral gathering expedition, his arms and legs will be lacerated and bleeding, for it is vile stuff. We wanted it not only for its own sake, for coral is a magnificent specimen, but for the sake of the myriads of crustaceans that live in its labyrinth of passageway. And so the coral is cracked by means of geological hammers, and the graduate students at the university sort it and pick over the specimens with tweezers or forceps. And here is Dr. Taylor of the University of Michigan, our marine botanist, displaying some of the algae or seaweed. Dr. Taylor. At another table sits Dr. Fraser of the University of British Columbia. He is showing Captain Hancock some of the interesting specimens of plankton. In the upper right-hand corner comes into view a palpitating heart, and there is a movement suggestive of digestive organs, another heart beating rapidly. Surely the inmost secrets of this little creature are betrayed to our eyes. If we follow the gaze of Dr. Palmer, ship's surgeon, 
We are just in time to see the tremendous hulk of a whale submerging or sounding as it is called. Whales are abundant in the Gulf of California. Immediately Valero 3 was stopped and a speedboat put over. We were able to pursue the fleeing whales at a speed of 35 miles an hour. There were two objects to our game. One was to be somewhere else other than where the whale was when he came up. For running aground on a whale would be just like striking a sandbar. The other was to be on the side of the whale from which the wind was blowing. For whales do everything in a big way. And I needn't tell you how unpleasant it was should the whale have halitosis. And so we leave the twin geysers of the whale and we pass to the southward across the equator to the Galapagos Islands, which are located 600 miles west of Ecuador. We anchor at Black Beach Anchorage, Charles Island, also known as Floriana, and are met by Dr. Ritter and Frau Dora Kerwin. It is the third time that Hancock expeditions have visited the island retreat of this couple, and they are greeting Captain Hancock and Dr. Schmidt, who follows him out of the skiff, as old friends. This couple has forsaken a life of comfort and convenience in Germany to end their days in exile. And just as soon as we have loaded up the donkey, we will begin a trek of 45 minutes from Bat Beach Anchorage to Frido, their hermit home. Here, the couple has established a Garden of Eden. Dr. Ritter is Adam, and Dora Kerwin is Eve. Like the original couple, they wear no clothing at all, except when visitors arrive on their island. The milk can will become a watering pot for Dora Kerwin's flower garden, and there are many uses for the utensils and supplies that have been brought from Valero 3. Water is always scarce in the Galapagos, and a shower bath is a luxury. You'll have to pardon our motion picture director, who is bringing up the rear. Accustomed to trekking only along Hollywood Boulevard, he was not accustomed to seven miles of Galapagos lava. Fortunately, the home of the Viennese Baroness Wagner Bosque was not far away. Perhaps you remember reading about the so-called queen of the Galapagos Islands. She is not beautiful, but yet attractive enough to have lured two European men to share her exile. The one of them, Philipson, the other Lorenzo, and it is Lorenzo whom you see in this picture. The marine iguana is the only lizard in the world that lives in the sea. There are other iguanas to be found in the Galapagos Islands, land iguanas inhabiting South Seymour Island. And here is one of them craning his neck to get a better view of these strange intruders. If left to his own resources, he would beat a hasty retreat, hiding himself deep in the crevices of the lava boulders. Unfortunately, he left just enough of his tail protruding to enable Captain Hancock to get a hand hold. And now who will be victor in this strange encounter, man or reptile? And just as it seems that Captain is master of the situation, the iguana grabs him by the foot. We come now to reptiles of a different kind, the giant tortoises of the islands, the Galapagos from which the islands received their name. A Galapago attains a ripe old age of several hundred years, and here is a young Galapago emerging from the nest. He is just a vest pocket edition of the larger animal, or a hip pocket edition, as Carl, our Finnish boatman, finds to his pleasure. Aha, thinks Carl, now I'll have both hands free to handle Gertie, as the mother later became known. But what's this? Something has happened. Ouch! And even the monkey has to join in the laughter. It will be some little time before Carl puts a snapping turtle in his pocket again. 
Some of the most beautiful birds of tropic seas have the most ungainly names, and these masters of aerial navigation are known as boobies. Here is a young booby, just three days old and without a stitch of clothing on, and we watch him snuggle under mother's protecting breast and crook his wing around her large webbed foot. The flightless cormorant was unknown to science 50 years ago, and in another 50 years, the birds may be extinct unless rigorous means are exercised to ensure their survival. Notice the tiny atrophied wing, no larger than a pullet's wing. Another flightless bird found in the Galapagos Islands is the penguin, brought to the equator by the cold Humboldt Current, which sweeps up the west coast of South America and bathes Galapagos shores. Think of it, penguins on the equator. The tropic bird has well been called the queen of tropic seas. It is not a tern, as one might suppose, but belongs to a family of its own. A family of which there are three members, the red-billed tropic bird shown here, the yellow-billed tropic bird of the Caribbean Sea, and the red-tailed tropic bird of the Hawaiian Islands. Our next sequence might be entitled With Helmet and Hose, or Invading the Realm of King Neptune, for just as soon as our diver has this helmet of copper and lead placed over his head, and as soon as he steps beneath the surface of the water, he is literally in another world, a world in which fishes instead of birds seem to float before his astonished eyes. There are bass and wrasse and gobies and blennies and angelfish and triggerfish and more kinds of fish than I could possibly mention. The striped ones are called sergeant majors. Meantime, the pumping goes on, minute after minute, hour after hour. A strange spider crab. If you watch carefully, you will see him exhale. The octopus is universally feared and dreaded by deep sea divers. Fortunately for our diver, this was just a little octopus. We were able to bring him on deck. Notice the tiny evil eyes, and as we turn him over, the large sucking discs that enable him to cling tenaciously to his helpless victims. Now to Chico, our monk. Any large fish-like animal is a man-eating shark, and Chico doesn't like sharks. No siree. The manta measured 15 feet and 6 inches from tip to tip of his bat-like wings. And you would be sure that each one of us had his picture taken beside the manta to show the folks at home what we had captured on our rod and reel. From the Galapagos Islands, we came to the bird islands of Peru. On the way, we encountered a terrific storm. We were glad to come to the quiet waters of the Ballestas Islands of Peru. And while two of our number are climbing the precipitous slopes, I'll tell you just a little about the most interesting industry in the world based upon the conservation of bird life. In the next picture, you will see, literally, millions of birds. They are all of one species, the white-breasted cormorant, known locally as the guanai and they nest so abundantly that it is impossible for them to take flight except at the edge of the nesting area. These birds are the producers of guano, the world's most valuable fertilizer. Captain Hancock is always on hand to take a picture that might be overlooked by our expedition photographers. On this occasion, it is the hatching from the egg of the Peruvian pelican. Notice that first of all, the pelican cracks a circle around the large end of the egg. And as it emerges, it is very black, very naked, and totally helpless. This process usually requires several hours, 
but by means of lapsed time exposure, we have brought it within the compass of a few minutes. From the beginning, we can tell by the underslung pouch that this bird is a pelican. We leave the bird islands of Peru by descending a rope ladder, one leg on either side. As the ship moves northward, our motion picture director calls us to the after boat deck to view the menagerie that had been accumulated in the course of almost three months of scientific exploration. As we pass the Galapagos Islands again, it is only fitting that we should view first of all the giant tortoises. Gertie, as she became known, was a great pet. You'll have to pardon Gertie because in all her 150 years or so of existence, she has not had the opportunity of learning table manners and must be instructed at this late date by Dr. Wegefort of the San Diego Zoo. Notice Gertie's goiter. And here is a tree iguana of the Secus Islands of Panama being fed by force. An onion given to a monkey affords him no end of pleasure. He likes to bathe in the fragrant oil. A sloth clings to a timber upside down as he might cling to a cecropia tree. The porcupine or perquispine of Latin America nibbles at a carrot, and this little busybody, the coati, eats all the hydroids off the rock. The guan is the South American turkey, and when guan and monkey mix, it takes a strong man to extricate them. Can you imagine anything more woebegone or more forlorn than a seasick flamingo? And of all the poor birds to be weak in the knees when there is so much need to be weak. Our final scene shows Valero III passing between Mejia Island on the left and Angel de la Guardia Island on the right in the Gulf of California. The Gulf is spectacular with its rainbow colors. It is an ideal place for photography as well as scientific exploration. Our final picture shows Captain Hancock on the bridge of Valero III, guiding her to the termination of another successful expedition. And in the language of the Latins, whose country we have been visiting, your announcer, John Garth, bids you adios. I'm amused every single time I watch that video. It's so great. It's so also so wild to think that I sit at my desk and, you know, create posts for social media where other Smithsonian employees have you know, been on ships and run into nudist colonies. So I'm always deeply entertained. I love your choice, Kira. Um, we want everyone to, to kind of jump into the Q&A if you have questions. Um, I think I have a few questions for Kira, if you don't mind. I can, I can start us off if, um, if folks want a few minutes to, to kind of formulate their questions. Um, but Kira, I, your presentation was awesome. I think as you were you know, talking about the collections assessment, the survey you talked about, you know, the units needing to prioritize which AV materials are gonna be digitized. Um, so I'm wondering how you make that decision. Is it, do you, do you digitize AV materials based on the needs of researchers, research requests, or is it, you know, the collections that are deteriorating the most rapidly? I'm sure it's a messy, it's a messy, it's a messy question. So I'm sure it's a messy answer. Yes. <laughs> Yes to all of that. Yes to messy question. Yes to messy answer. Um, for the most part, it is reference requests and digitization on demand. However, one of the nice things that kind of came out of the survey and assessment is that we uh, we were getting ready to write a grant proposal for some at-risk materials. I was trying to identify what kind of at-risk materials I wanted to use, trying to find a good subset of collections. Uh, and that's when I, I started by looking at the formats we had in our collections because I had no idea of all of the different 45 formats that we had. 
And that's when I stumbled upon the wax cylinders that were shown in that one picture and then the lacquer discs, uh, which ultimately led me to the world is yours and that radio program. And it's now one of my most favorite things. It is, um, it is a fantastic program. And so we are trying to do more proactive digitization with AV, uh, especially through grant funding and whatnot, but it's, it's, hard. It's hard. We've got a huge collection. There's always researcher requests for it. And so it's trying to find that balance between like addressing the needs of the researchers and addressing the needs of our collections at the same time. Plus with AV, it's hard for people to know what the content is and see what the content is. And once things are digitized, then people can see it and want more and can ask for more. But until we get there, it's, it's harder to, harder to advocate for it. That makes a lot of sense. And you made that really not messy. So thank you. Um, well, good. <laughs> uh, you also, I mean, anyone, I think a lot of people on this call have seen our office before. Um, but for those of you who haven't, I sit really right across the hall from Kira. Um, and even though I sit right across the hall, I just think of Kira in the very kind of bouncing back and forth between like our very dark digitization labs. Um, Kira, what do you do every day? What is your day to day? Like, tell me, tell me start to finish. I'm sure it's so different, but, but give me an idea of what your day looks like. Oh, I wish I had a day today. I feel like that would be nice. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, AV digitization is just a portion of what I do. I, um, I also oversee our image digitization. We have, um, two digitization labs, not that are fully staffed right now, partly because of the pandemic, partly because of um, changes in job responsibilities and whatnot. But, uh, but I oversee our image digitization as well. And then once those materials are digitized, I am responsible for everything from actually getting them digitized through getting them into our digital asset management system, um, making sure that those records exist in some fashion in our collection management system and cataloged in some way, and then helping our web team push them out um, for online access, especially on the imaging side with AV web delivery is a little bit messier right now, but, um, but for our image content, like all, all of that comes through me. And I have, I have two amazing staff people, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of content. It sounds, uh, sounds like a lot, but also I feel like I'm constantly leaning on you in the office for all, you know, digitization things. You're just in the know of so much. And, um, so yeah, I just, oh, that's just me saying, I always appreciate you. Um, I guess, I guess I have one more question too. Um, folks, please, please jump in. If you, if you feel like you have questions about the film or about Kira's work, but I've got another one and that is about access. Um, I'm going to ask you like the dreaded question, I think you know, everyone really detests, but why is not, like, why are our collections not all online? Why isn't everything online, Kira? Uh, so part of it is that the Smithsonian is required by law to adhere to um, WCAG 2.0 AA accessibility compliance. And with audiovisual content, that is a lot more complicated. Um, with images, it involves transcription of written documents, whether handwritten or typed, um, and image caption, alt text, all of that stuff. But with AV content, it is for audio, it's full captions and transcripts for everything. For video, it's got the added complication of not only full captions and transcripts, but also um, there's an audio description component, which is a verbal description, somebody actually saying out loud the physical elements that you're seeing on the screen. Um, it's not, a lot of people think audio description is like sort of the um, saying the bangs and the pows and it, that's not audio description in the sense, audio description in the sense is saying things like two females on the screen, one is wearing, you know, one is blonde in a gray sweater, except that type of thing and verbally saying it. And that is a very complicated thing to do. And it's also expensive. Um, we don't have the resources in-house. I don't have the 
time to to caption everything and certainly not to do audio description and so we often contract that responsibility out and it is it it is expensive um and that's a big barrier to being able to put this stuff online part of it the other side of that is just being able to digitize the content so one because ev digitization is not my primary responsibility um i am not able to dedicate 100 percent of my time to doing this which affects this but also AV digitization happens in real time. So if you've got an hour of videotape, it takes minimum an hour and 15 minutes to digitize that. You need to play the entire hour long video uh, through the playback decks. And then there's usually at least 15 minutes or so of post-processing at the end. And so it's, it's a lot more time intensive as well and takes so much more time. And of course that all makes it harder to put it all up online. I wish we could though, there's some great stuff in here. And I will just shout out Kira is actually um, the person behind this series, this film fest series. Um, and I think, I think Kira in the last, like during, during this, this time of extended telework, I think you specifically have made a really great effort to get a lot of our collections on our YouTube channel. So our here at, our here at the Smithsonian TV series. So um, I encourage everybody to kind of check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's been really fun um, to kind of see a whole series be shared like that. It's been nice to have this opportunity of not being able to create new content to um, to take the time to be able to evaluate ways to be able to share our existing content and to be able to take time too to focus on things like getting our audio material captioned, getting our video material captioned, um, things like that so that we can make it accessible and sort of being able to think through with you strategies of how to of how to how to raise awareness for this and how to do this. It's 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 been one of the the rays of sunshine in the pandemic thus far. <laughs> Um, we did get a private message that I think um, is great to share with everyone. And the question was about these two new positions with AVMPI. Maybe you could talk mm -hmm. a little more about AVMPI and specifically those two jobs. Nice plugs. <laughs> sure. Um, so the two new positions that we're hiring, hiring for right now, one of them is the initiative coordinator. So this person will basically be the point person for um, everything AVMPI, all of the staff uh, with the exception of the curator, will report to the initiative coordinator, and um, they will they will sort of be like the administrative head and the point person for the unit stakeholders that are going to be participating in this, um, and the curator of recorded media. So one of the things that we determined was important to us when designing EVMPI was not just digitizing these things, but creating awareness through. Um, access and education um, and actually being able to use this material and get this material out to people. So the curator will be sort of looking at the content um, to a certain extent, have some decision-making flexibility in uh, like identifying content that fits with other Smithsonian initiatives, such as um, the American Women's History Initiative and um, the Race in Our Shared Future initiative and things like that that are happening and sort of identifying collections within the units that could be great supports for those, um, as well as creating these sort of curated collections of materials on a pan-institutional level, which is something that we as AV archivists, like we know that we all have great content and that a lot of it can relate to each other in various ways, but we don't have the ability um, or the time to make those connections. And so we're hoping that the, the curator can sort of help do that. Um, so I think the positions close next Friday, something yeah, like next week. Everyone should um, check out the chat and feel free to share those postings around because Deborah and Rosemary both pop those in there. So thank you for that. It's really exciting. I think, you know, the stats you shared from the assessment about how much loss the Smithsonian might potentially sustain if there was nothing done about it. Um, that no Those numbers are so scary. But then to, to hear all of the great, um, the great plans for the, for AVMPI, I think it's it's just really great. I'm, I'm very excited for it. I really look forward to it. Um, there are so many great audiovisual materials in our collection that I'm learning about all the time, um, which it I was think- definitely, It was definitely scary and daunting to see those numbers, um, but 
at the same time, it has been, it has given us great momentum into getting something um, done on a pan-institutional level because we were immediately able to say like, look, this is a real problem here um, and not just a, and not just an individual unit product problem, but a Smithsonian wide um, problem. So it's, I, I don't think, I think that we kind of expected that doing the survey and assessment would have some sort of impact. I don't think um, that we quite expected it would turn into AVMPI, but um, I think that AVMPI is is going to be greater than we, uh, than we could have ever dreamed for. So we're very excited about it. I agree. Um, if you're curious about more of the types of audiovisual materials we have in our collection, yes, thank you. Shout out, uh-huh. Um, yes, um, so going to Tammy's content. Yeah. So um, the AVMPI, especially initially, will be, um, fun- is being funded by the National Collections Program um, at the Smithsonian. So yes, shout out to the National Collections Program. They have been instrumental in this whole AV advocacy push. They also actually funded the grants to do the survey and the assessment in the first place. One comment in the Q and A's. Okay. Um, Yeah, well, I I, I think this is a great note to end on. Um, A lot of excitement about AVMPI. Thank you so much, Kira, for presenting. Again, we're very excited to get our AV materials out there. So I'm gonna make one more plug for next month's program. Um, So on Friday, October 22nd at 12 noon, Jacqueline Pratka will be presenting three films from the early history of the Smithsonian, or from the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden from the 60s and 70s. And they're great. And they've got a lot of familiar faces um, in them. And I think it's just gonna be really fun. And then after, the screenings, Jacqueline will interview Anna Brooke, who really helped establish the Hirshhorn Library. So it's it's going to be a really great program that we're really excited about. Um, so we want to thank you all again so much. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Deborah and Rosemaria for being um, great with the links and helping coordinate this program. Um, thank you again. As Kira mentioned, we're really so excited to get our stuff out there. And so we really appreciate you joining us after work hours today, and we hope to see you at our future programs. So thank you so much, everybody.